and three um if we end up talking more and uh we don't get through everything that's fine um but we'll see where we get uh so chapter two was all about system setup um and i added to so i added to the content of the chapter a little bit with uh the book what they forgot to teach you about r which is also by jenny bryan along with um Jim Hester originally, and then Shannon Pelegi and E. David Aha have done the um, workshops more recently with it. And so uh, they are now also co-authors on that. And that's just kind of about, or it's about a lot of things, but among other things, system setup is a big part of that book. So I uh, brought that in here. So the learning objectives that I pulled out is uh, to be able to check which version of R you're using and which version of R Studio. Uh, to use pack to install packages. That's not actually in the book, but uh, I think it is worth doing. Um, using dev tools to simplify common package development tasks. Uh, to configure your R profile to operate in developer mode. They do, they go into that a little tiny bit, but I'm going to go into that a little bit more. Um, setting up RStudio hotkeys for package development tasks. I brought that in here just because it was something uh, that they went over at the uh, workshop that Jenny and Headley taught at uh, PositConf. It's really like, we don't really need the stuff I'm going to talk about there until chapter 13, but just to kind of introduce it. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about enabling a full build tool chain on your system. And we're going to find and fix issues with your dev setup, or at least know how to do it. All right. So for starters, that, so um, Figuring out what R version you're using, there were some notes here that went into a lot more details before, but I just cut it down to really this r.version.string. That'll tell you what version of R you're using. So will the sit rep that we're going to do at the very end of all this, but just to check. Um, when you are working on a package, if it's a package that you intend to publish, it's a good idea to make sure that you have at least uh, one instance of the latest version of R somewhere. Um, so that you're not working and then find out, oh, uh, it doesn't actually work anymore because they changed something or whatever. Um, eventually, we will talk about setting up um, GitHub Actions so that you can check that it works on all kinds of different R versions and different computers and things like that. But uh, for starters, it's a good idea to try to be up to date. All of that is saying that. Um, there's also session info if you want to like really dig into what you have to compare it to what someone else has. And there's even a package session info, which is part of DevTools. So we will be seeing that occasionally. Uh, next, our studio version. I put a link in there to download and install our studio from Posit. Uh, technically, you don't have to work in our studio to do all of this stuff, but they go like they do, uh, Jenny and Hadley do. And so a lot of their tips and tricks will be pretty our studio specific. So I think as you're learning, it's just easier if you work in RStudio. Um, so you can get that out of RStudio API version info, the version piece. And um, yeah, so uh, Stas asked about uh, stylers and linters, which we will talk about a little bit um, in here and also probably later in the book. And um, like, I, you know, as I was kind of answering your question for number two, um, like IDEs other than our studio, Visual Studio Code is another popular one, but, um, or VS Code rather. Um, it's, I don't use any of those. I know some people do. There's a lot of work involved in making them as good as our studio. And I like, if you're working in other languages a lot, then okay. Uh, but I don't see a lot of benefit in it personally because it's a lot of work to get up to almost as good as our studio. I've never quite understood uh, why I would want to go through that um, versus just install our studio. All right, uh, so they talk about uh, using dev tools or technically the remotes package to install things from GitHub. Um, and they have a line in there about how pack isn't like quite done or not done, but it's not like, established yet at the time that they were writing a few months ago, or I guess half a year ago. Um, it's pretty much 
what they recommend now. And so I definitely recommend it. Uh, Pack is the latest um, like package installation manager from the RStudio, or I guess the Posit folks. Um, it's slated or it's listed as being faster and more reliable for package installation. And the thing that I um, really like, and okay, just to answer it, Stas, Copilot's in our studio now too. So if that's the reason to use VS Code, then there isn't a reason to use VS Code. Um, it, yeah, it, working with Docker has some stuff. Anyway, um, so the, the relevant question right now though is uh, what's the relationship between Renv and Pack? Renv is for like keeping track of what packages and versions, whatever you're working on uses. Um, in the package development workflow, you won't use Renv a lot most likely because um, you need your description file to answer that question. Like it, it needs to be able to tell other people what to use without ha them having to use Renv. And so I actually don't work with Renv that much on a lot of the stuff I do. So it, it keeps like keeps track of making sure everything's in sync. Pack is actually what Renv uses in order to install things. And so it pack can grab specific versions of packages pretty well. Um, it's good at updating. Like if you install something from GitHub, which is what this line pack, pack our lib slash dev tools, that's going to install the dev version of dev tools from GitHub. Um, if you do later, just do update dot packages, it won't get your GitHub packages. It doesn't know how to update those, but if you do pack pack, it will un update, um, everything relevant to what you are working on. So whatever project you have open, um, including things that are from GitHub. Um, I have a screenshot here. So, uh, oh, a thing that I really like is it deals with packages that are loaded in your current session. So if you have dev tools, like I had um, already used dev tools in this session, normally if that's loaded, a lot of things will fail to install it because it's like, oh, that's loaded. It's lo at least on, I think that's a Windows specific thing, but it's locked. It can't be installed because it's being used. Pack just deals with that. Um, and so it tells you it's loaded in the current R session. And then after you install, you'll need to, to restart in order to get the update. But um, that's easy enough to do. Uh, it also resolves system dependencies, not just other packages, but other like, um, you know, other programs that you need to have installed. That's especially a thing for Linux. Sometimes you have to go install something and uh, Pack will deal with that. Um, so good to use. Uh, I think that's everything on that one. Any, um, any more questions? I think I answered everything in the chat. All right. So it can handle system dependencies? That feels like the most likely. Yes. So okay. um, it's one of like uh, system dependencies are actually really easy on Windows. And I don't know why people complain about work or people, non-Windows users like to complain about how hard it is to use Windows for with R. It, it just deals with the system dependencies. So I don't think about that much. I haven't been working on Linux in a while where I did have a lot of problem with system dependencies. In fact, just deals with it. Um, yeah, so uh, Anhel pointed out that sometimes to deal with installation problems, you just like remove a package and then install it again. And I, I'll add to that remove dot packages on the package and then pack pack the ins the package you want to install. It'll grab it from uh, CRAN if you don't tell it a um, something else, or it can grab GitHub versions of things. Um, as we go, we'll probably have a point where we want to install some dev version of something, and we'll talk about exactly how to do that. Like, it's, you can install specific, um, like a specific branch of a GitHub repository. Uh, I haven't used Groundhog. I don't know that one, but it's um, Packrat was the um, immediate predecessor to Pack. And pack also uh, like replaces remotes as well. So, um, yeah, I thought Groundhog okay. was solving a similar problem to RN versus pack. Okay. Just like one of the one of my understandings of pack, not having used it but just having had it sold to me, was that 
the order of yes. operations in which just install dot packages installs things is not thoughtful at all. Um, when and pack is so it has that's one that's... of the efficiencies. <laughs> but yes, Groundhog and RN for on their own for being two separate things. Yeah. Um, so tech, yeah, technically under the hood, eventually probably pack is calling install dot packages. Um, but it's setting some things up ahead of time if it needs to. And so it's just better at sorting out uh what you want. Or, you know, it might do the download of the package to a temp folder and then install from file, um, different things like that. So all right. Uh, dev tools. So, um, you know, I, I showed installing the dev version of dev tools here because dev tools is like, it's this book, uh, dev tools slash use this uh, are basically what this book is made out of. Um, it is a set of packages for developing packages. Uh, so, and they're technically both dev tools and use this do have uses outside of developing packages, but if you're developing packages, you want DevTools. Use this is in the depends section of DevTools, which means if you library DevTools, you also library use this, like they are kind of one package. They used to actually be one package and then they split use this out of it and split pretty much everything else out of DevTools as well. So DevTools is basically like Tidyverse where it's wrapping a whole bunch of other packages except even more so because it re-exports all of the functions from these other packages that it like that they deem important. Um, so uh, the first one other than use this that is wrapping is remotes and like I said pack um, basically re or completely replaces remotes. Um, package build, which is something that will be used behind the scenes to like build your package. So that's pretty useful to have. Uh, package load also loads your package. So um, the load all that we were discussing in the channel quite a bit earlier today, that's actually from package load. Uh, RCMD check runs the check that makes sure that nothing's broken in your package. And it does all kinds of like making sure that the um, examples in your documentation can actually run and all kinds of different things like that. Um, so that package is useful. Uh, session info, like I mentioned, mentioned, just makes it uh, gives all the information about what is going on on your machine. So that if you're trying to tell someone about a bug, you can give them the session info. And a lot of times they'll be like, oh, you actually have an old version of this dependency of a dependency. And that is causing a problem or something like that. Um, Test that, that's chapters 13 through 16 or 17 of this book, I think, or 13 through 15, something like that. Uh, that's for testing your packages and technically you can test things other than packages, but it's easiest to test packages. Uh, Roxygen 2, that's documentation. So that that's those um, hash uh, apostrophe things that we saw in, the, in chapter one. It's just ways to mark up your code and automatically document your code. Um, Lifecycle is a package. So um, <laughs> we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so Lifecycle is a package for managing the lifecycle of package functions. And uh, it has some confusing names that cause all kinds of controversy on social media from time to time because they'll talk about a package or a function becoming superseded. Uh, that is a lifecycle stage. And superseded means we're not going to mess with this function anymore. We're leaving it as is. In other words, it's like the safest it can possibly be. You should not complain if something becomes superseded. It means it won't change anymore and any code that you have will just work. Um, so uh, anyway, we'll talk about those life cycles. I think that's like chapter 19 or something. Um, package down. Uh, you can make a website for your packages. And this is one of the ones where use this was super useful because I had like set aside a day. I'm finally going to learn to use package down. I have these packages. How do I use this? And I guess I'll start with this function. Um, use package down. Actually, it's like use uh, package down GitHub pages. That's the, the one from use this. And that 
so ended my day of learning to use package down because it just did it and it makes a website for your package and you don't have to like you can configure it but you don't have to it's a really useful pa package um and then profviz interactive visualizations for profiling r code this is useful outside of uh package development and actually i don't think we're going to talk a lot about it in here um i can't remember for sure but i don't think so uh advanced r has a lot more um uh, profiling code. So to answer the side question, keyboard shortcut for um, pound apostrophe or hashtag apostrophe. Um, if you are on the top line of a function and at least on Windows, it's control alt shift R inserts the whole Roxygen skeleton. And that would probably be like, uh, you know, whatever. It's the equivalent on uh, Apple or other machines, um, but control alt, it's all the keys and R um, inserts the skeleton. Um, it won't insert just the one character, but that can set it all up. Then you can just fill it in from there. Um, yes. All right. Uh, so next, um, they talk a little bit about the, our profile. Um, they talked about the function, use this, use dev tools which will put a little thing or give you a thing that you can put into your .r profile. And then you can also use this um, edit underscore r underscore profile. Um, our profile is really helpful when you're in package development mode. You can either put it just in your package direct um, project, or you can have one that is like for all of your R work. Um, it's a good idea to include things that make development easier, but you should avoid including anything that like actually changes the way code runs. And that can be a little bit of a fine line. Um, most of the time, it's not that fine. Uh, so like, uh, I'm actually gonna show you my R profile and go through it. But the example is that they uh, have this whole thing for using dev tools. It makes it so that basically you um, have dev tools libraried all the time. Um, if you are writing a package that wraps dev tools, then you shouldn't do that, but you probably also don't want to write that package anyway, because you want to wrap the individual pieces. Um, so, all right, let's just go into mine to have a better example of what this is all about. So, um, the first thing is when I am trying to debug, debug something, sometimes it's nice to just turn off everything that I want to do here. And so I, have, I the first thing I do at the top of my R profile is have this option that says John load stuff, set it to, to true. And um, I can just comment out that line if I don't, if I want that to not be set to true and then none of my stuff will happen. Um, there's an asterisk on this because actually some of the stuff that's down below that is inside of my um, block that turns everything off. I had to move outside because I actually do want it to run when I'm not um, interactive. And so I could just split it between the interactive and the options, I guess. I might have to do that later. Um, but yeah, so I have this one, or, or other than one little set of options, um, everything I have wrapped inside of this, if interactive, so that means if I am actually working um, with this rather than just running the code uh, non-interactively, like through a script. Um, and this get option, John load stuff is true and otherwise it'll be false. Um, so I checked that that exists. Uh, yes, so yeah, uh, our profile is just our code. Yes, I guess I should have pointed that out explicitly. Um, and so it's our code that runs um, the rstats.wtf has the whole tree of the order of things that run, but it runs like after R is loaded, but before you're into it. Um, so obviously it can load in or it can run in R. Um, the things I have in here. So I have um, all these options for uh, telling me if it's doing partial matching um, for anything. Uh, because R will sometimes do partial matching and not, not tell you, although I think some of these might have been flipped to true in a recent version of R. 
I'm not sure. Um, but I have those so that they tell me, um, mostly because that means that I have like, or often it can mean I have a typo in a function where I'm calling some other function within my package or some other package and have a typo in the name or the argument. And so I want to know that. So that's what that's all about. There's this rline global handle that makes your error messages prettier um, and easier to trace. So I recommend that one. Um, again, it's just how it displays to you. It doesn't actually change any of the functionality of it. Um, I have a couple options. This one was actually from uh, Efficient R, uh, the book that we had one club about it's back here somewhere. Um, when you have lines of code that are sent to your console, uh, by default, it shows like a plus for the, the new lines, which means that you can't copy and paste that code and run it. You have to delete those pluses. This is just two spaces instead of the plus, and it just makes the second line be indented instead of have a plus on it. And then you can copy and paste and run the code. So I like that a lot. And then Teddy models makes you tell it if you have dark mode, which I find kind of annoying, but I have that turned on. Um, I have all these use this options. So telling it that my full name is John Harmon in the description, you should put these things. And this is the directory where I want you to start new projects. Um, these are for populating when you make a new package, it just like puts this stuff in there. So you can put any of the description pieces in there. And then this is nice because, uh, I think throughout the book, they'll, they'll have examples where it shows you to put like dot dot slash in the name of your new package or whatever, when you're creating a new package, or you can just tell it where you want it to start. And then you don't have to constantly remember the relative path to where you want it to start. It just goes to the directory you tell it. Um, we're going to talk about GitHub at some point. Mostly Git creds takes care of all the GitHub stuff, but there are still a few places that look for this GitHub pat um, environment variable. And so I have it. Um, at this point, uh, it can just like git creds is handling my uh, personal access token for GitHub, but this other environment variable should have that same value sometimes. So that's what this is doing. Um, and then these two are the ones that actually have to happen uh, non-interactively or the automatic posting of the book club videos doesn't work. So um, that's what these are for. So, so the idea is these are just some weird or some automatic caching things. Uh, I have a note to myself that they could cause problems. So that's there. Um, and then here's what they actually uh, inserted was uh, suppress messages require dev tools that will load dev tools. Um, the reason to do re require instead of library is it won't error if for some reason dev tools is, isn't installed, it will just give a warning. Um, which is important because I want the rest of my uh, R profile to work if for some reason DevTools isn't installed. I also load rep reprex because then it makes easier um, sharing of uh, examples. And then I have my personal and this package that it's use this and this, and that's my personal extension that basically it just wraps some use this functions with um, defaults that I like. Uh, so that's the idea there. Um, and then I have this uh, prompt it is a package that you can use to change your RStudio prompt. Well, I think it's technically your R prompt. Um, and I have it, uh, it does bracket and then the name of the branch and the time and then an end bracket and the greater than. So that tells me um, the main reason for this is it'll tell me if I'm in my main Git branch and I don't want to edit anything. If I'm in my main Git branch, I want to create a new branch. So that's what that tells me. And then the time is just because um, that way I have a kind of built-in timer. If I run two functions in a row, I can see roughly how long there was in between them. Um, that can be useful if I want to go, wait, how long did that take? Um, so that's what that's for. Uh, just a note that this is imperfect. Like when our studio first loads, it usually says main. And then after I do something, it'll go, oh, wait, no, you're on this other branch. Um, so, um, I'm in the habit of just like hitting enter a couple of times when I first load anything to make sure everything is what I think it is. Um, 
And then I have this uh, funky thing set hook that says, oh, if you're starting a brand new RStudio session, run this. Uh, uh, oh, it, it, I do a little bit of work to make sure I get rid of the of RevDep. That is a package that uh, reverse dependency checker. And if you are working with a package that's on CRAN and you have this RevDep folder, uh, it's annoying to, to have it do what it's about to do on that. So I get rid of that folder. And then I run this to do our um, package it has this to do our function and it searches everything other than revved up in my active project to tell me anywhere where I put to do colon in any of my code. And so it gives me like a report of to do. And there are also a few other things that to do are we'll check for, but that way when I start a new project or when I reopen a project, it shows me the list of all the things that I'm working on. Um, and that's appended. Okay. And then I, I actually have uh, a few things that I've just been adding where I throw some functions in with a dot. So it's, they're invisible in my global environment, but so I have them for things I am working on right now. So I have this open proj function in and this, which will open a project of mine. It like pens the path onto it properly. Um, and so I just started doing this um, to try to, it's like a new idea I'm playing with to put in the things I'm actively working on so I can quickly open them and switch back and forth between things. So, all right, that's all. That's my our profile. I'm going to catch up a little bit. Um, okay. So, yeah, they all are still worn partials false. So, good. I'm glad I still have that. Um, and it then Groundhog stuff. Okay. <laughs> Any questions before I move on? Comments, thoughts? All right. Um, some quick hotkey things. Uh, one that you will be using or will be using a lot. Actually, all of these will probably be using a fair amount. Uh, Control Shift L is that load all function. Um, when you're working within your um, your own package, it's helpful to do that because then all of the functions in your package, including un unexported functions, are available for you to use. So when you're testing code, it works. It, that also loads um, all the test that framework, uh, the, the harness around test that. And so that makes just everything in package dev easier. Um, Control Shift D is document. So that will redocument your package. Um, which again, we'll talk about a lot, especially in chapter 16. Uh, control shift E does the R CMD check. Um, it's just, a, you know, again, we'll get in the habit of doing that all the time to make sure that nothing is broken in our packages. And then control shift B um, installs the package and libraries it. Technically it installs the package, restarts R, and then libraries the package, uh, your active package. Um, we'll talk about that. Uh, I said 3.5. I'm not sure if that's right. I don't remember. We'll see. Um, but uh, anyway, those are useful to have. And then the two that I added on, well, I think, I think two of these are added on and I couldn't, I didn't like reset everything to remember what is, what did I add and what did I not add? So I can't remember which of these are in um, the default setup. Uh, but if you go into tools, modify short keyboard shortcuts in our studio, um, there are two functions or two, two, whatever settings that are really helpful for whatever file you're working in. And then there's two settings that are super useful for your entire package. So look for run a test file. You want that to be control T. I'm pretty sure that, that might be default. I can't remember for sure. Um, and then report test coverage for a file with control R. And the idea is that these are both control. So T and R test and, and report or coverage. I don't know, R because that's the, the key that's available. Um, and so that's what they recommended in the workshop. What this will do, again, we're, we'll see a lot more of this in starting in chapter 13, but this one will run all the tests that you have configured and this one will look for code within this file that you're working on that isn't covered by any tests. We will talk about why that's useful later, but um, that's the useful one to set up. And then 
equivalent to that, but across the entire package is control shift T runs tests for all the packages or all the, all the, or your entire package that you have uh, loaded. Pretty sure that one is set up by default. And then report test coverage for the entire package is control shift R. So uh, we'll talk about those more, but I like those a lot. Uh, all right. <laughs> I don't go into the R build tool chain in detail here, um, just to point out that you do like need a compiler and related tools to install some packages from source. Um, all of these are system tools outside of R. And so uh, as you need them, apparently R Studio is getting better and better at telling you about that. Um, but also the book goes through for all the different OSs about how to do it. On Windows, it's you install R or you, you know, download and install the R tools um, executable, which has a whole bunch of things built into it. Um, different systems, you'll have to install different things, and that's all very specific to your system. So, use the book to do that. But something that's hard to, or, or I don't know, it's not necessarily immediately clear is these are things that are not R packages, so it's outside of R. It has to be dealt with outside of R. So John, two questions about yeah. this. Um, yep, no problem. So were these, it wasn't clear to me if these were specifically related just to C, and if you're not yet dealing with C, then you don't actually need these? I guess three questions. Two, yeah. if that tool, <laughs> is that something that um, Pat can deal with? And three, um, it looks like the SIT rep doesn't actually report on whether or not you have them installed. So it can't discover hmm. that, I think, or I could be wrong. I don't know because I have them installed and it's hard to go back to the state of not having them installed. Um, I did that a while ago and I don't remember. Um, it's not only working with compiling code. There is stuff about, um, like I know at least for Windows for like building PDF versions of documentation, which is part of the bundle, but you don't have that for your own packages. And so that gets done automatically that way. And I don't remember what all else, but it's just, there are several things that you need when you're developing a package that you don't need when you're not developing a package. Um, and then relatedly that you need if you're trying to install a package that isn't yet uh, built into the binaries, which we'll talk about uh, if we get into chapter three. Um, so yeah, once they're on CRAN and technically now you can use our universe, um, probably talk about that a little bit later. They also do builds on there. And so that might, if you can't get this working, um, there's an alternative route that's probably more complicated, but uh, yeah. So it's, it's definitely useful to do this. Um, I, I guess I can't say definitely, but it's a it's nice to do this while you're thinking about it so that you don't run into it later. And then yeah, there is this dev sit rep, um, which at least on Windows tells you that you have R tools um or not. So I don't know what the equivalent to this is on non-Windows. Um but yeah, it tells you your R version, your R tools path, your uh, our studio version, whether you have dev tools, and then a little bit about the package that you're working on. I don't have a bad version of this because I had everything working. Um, I guess I probably, well, wait, no, you can't uninstall dev tools <laughs> and then run, run dev sit rep. So um, I'm not sure what all you can do here, but uh, they, I, I did see examples that it will show you, um, it, like now they can put, if you have the right, if you have CLI installed, at least you can, they can put messages that are just, you click and it'll run the code or it'll load a web page or different things like that. And so they do that to some degree where it'll kind of automatically fix it. Um, but yeah, uh, hopefully this will help. It, it can at least Id help identify what is wrong. And then from there, someone else can help you fix it. And, you know, obviously they don't mention it in the book, but um mention it or but uh post on 
Slack if you have any issues with any of this. And yes, it, the dev sit rep is in dev tools. Um, <laughs> see, and that's why you should put dev tools in your our profile and then you have it loaded and you uh, can't not have it loaded. So um, yeah, it's not gonna show our tools, but it might show something equivalent maybe. Yeah. yeah. I don't see anything though, but. Okay. Maybe I don't know what I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they they claimed that as you are doing things on our studio, our studio now will tell you what's missing. Again, I haven't worked. Um, I worked on Linux a little bit relatively recently, but most of the time I work on Windows. So I can't answer the question off the top of my head, at least, of what, what else to do. All right, any other questions about that chapter? We can at least start chapter three. I doubt we will finish it. All right. So chapter oh, three, no, actually- there are tools. No, R tools, yeah, it's required for many packages. I think a string R, um, at right. least for Windows, I needed to start as a separate program. So I manually went to, to cram and download manually. Yeah. Um, so our tools is Windows specific. Uh, it's a wrapper of a bunch of tools that you may use or it might need, but there there are equivalent requirements. A lot of the stuff is built into Linux and therefore built into Mac. So that's part of the difference of why it has to exist and why it might not be telling you on a Mac that you don't have it because it's just kind of built in. Um, yeah, and I know but that- yeah, that for stringy- yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it's a it's a C compiler. Yes. So that's that's the reason that we can run C from R. The, the string R, data table, R packages that, that compile C. So you need yeah. the but R you, tools to run it. So you don't though, because if you just wait, um the Windows binaries get uh built. So you only actually need the C compiler if you want to install onto Windows like the day a new release comes out before uh, before the update. And yeah, it it's the C compiler, but it's also a bunch of other tools. That's why. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, yes. So you do have the C compiler, but, uh, you know, you might not have uh pandoc and you might not have all the other things that come along the, for the ride in our tools um anyway but yeah so technically you don't need it uh you can get by but you just have to say no when it says if you want to use um or if you want to compile packages that need compi uh, compilation and then it'll just install from the binaries um which isn't an option like uh on linux you have to be you have to be able to do that, which normally doesn't take any work. It just work, you know, it'll just work. Um, all right, anything else? Okay. So let's see. chapter three is about um the five states of a package, plus they do talk about repositories. So I said five plus one. Um Recognize the difference between a source package and a bundled package. Use our building ignore to mark files for use in, only in the source package. And I realized that I stopped writing uh, learning objectives. But there are a few other things that we talk about within here. Um, so I'll have to come back and add the other learning objectives. But uh, basically, it's how to go between all the different states that there are for packages. So OK. There are these five plus one states. There's source, uh, the raw, editable form of the package bundled, which is where you take the source, you do a little bit of uh, work on it, and then you compress it to a single archive file, a tar.gz. There's binary, which is compiled. Um, if it has compiled code, it includes the compiled code, but it also just does some OS specific stuff to the package. Um, installed is where you take that binary and like put it into uh, your package library. Uh, in memory is where it's actually loaded. And then, uh, like I said, repository, which is the source or bundle, or it's you know either this or either one of these two, source or bundled, and it's hosted on a server other than your machine. So 
that's that plus one state. Um, all right, so this graphic, we're going to come back to it later, and I assume probably next week, but we'll see. Uh, the rest of this chapter is talking about these six states and how to go in between them. Um, and so we'll dig into this graphic in more details as we go. Uh, the first transition is source versus bundle. So source is like what we're going to be talking about throughout the rest of this book. It is the just raw text files that define your package. Um, and a bundle is where you take that uh, source and you do a little bit of work. So if you have a vignettes folder, you have to do a little bit of work to turn that into a direct or a um, like list of all the vignettes that are in your package. And then these files that get automatically built, the .r and .rmd and uh, .html within inst slash doc. And then it also keeps that vignettes articles.rmd. So that's the main thing that happens is it like processes vignettes. Um, it also ignores the r build ignore files. So if you have things in there, it says, oh, don't need those. Um, and so you might be wondering, okay, what does that mean? Well, that's there's .r build ignore is this file that you can have in your directory. And it's uh, a list of files that you want while you're working on the package. And anyone else who's working on the package would need these files, but the package doesn't actually use them. Um, a lot of times that will be like source files for data that's in your package. You can have that as uh, files that are in the dev version, but are not in the bundle. Um, in general, oh, um, readme.rmd, which we saw in the whole game, that's a uh, ignored file. Uh, it, it's the like dev version of readme.md. Um, and you can use this, use this function, use build ignore, but you probably won't often, if ever, have to actually call that because when you're doing other things and use this, it'll automatically add things to our build ignore. So if you say use readme rmd, it automatically sets that up. Um, and a thing they talk about in the book is you want to be careful about regex formatting of this, that you want to tell it where the beginning and end of whatever you're talking about is. So let's say you had art, you have a directory of art that you don't want to include in your uh, bundled version of your package. It's like, it's just source files. Um, if you just said art, it would match anything that has art in the name. And so it would get, you know, all these article things uh, versus if you say, you know, if you show the, if you do the carrot, which means start, and then art, and then dollar sign, which means end, it'll look for things that are art. Um, that's all that that is. All right. The next level up is binary. So a binary is a platform specific compiled kind of version of the package. Uh, so it takes all your .r files and makes these RDB files, which are just efficient storage of the actual like functions of your package. Um, it makes this meta directory um, that has metadata about the package. Uh, it takes your man um, directory, which is all the help docs, and converts it into HTML um, and help directories. Again, like you don't have to know these, just know that it's doing these. Takes anything that's in your source and compiles it. So um, we'll talk a little bit about that. That's for like code written in C or Rust or a few other things. Um, and so it'll like prepare it for use. Uh, it takes everything that's in your data uh, directory. We'll talk about using data and it'll make a more efficient version of all that. Um, you can have this inst directory and inst is like install. Anything that's in this directory just gets copied into the package directory at the top level of the package. And then um, a bunch of extraneous things that aren't actually used in the package, like readme.md, uh, build directories, which were created in the last step, um, your tests, your vignettes, those are all dropped in the binary. Any questions about that? No. So you're, uh, when you look at a function that's from a binary, I think, um, like your comments get dropped. Uh, yes. Are there other things that change 
about I don't know it does it does some uh, yeah I don't know what all what all happens behind the hood is that is that kind of one of the primary things that I should just be aware <laughs> of or are there other uh, things going on that I should know about this is a thing I virtually never think about I know it happens but it's not like you shouldn't have to worry about this just know that it does change things and it prepares it for like a platform specific version but it's um it it's basically it takes it from the dev version to the active use like the thing that can be used um and it i didn't like i didn't even realize that oh right yeah it's like storing all of the functions in these files like as code or as as executable code rather than just as the um the text that describes them even though it's basically the same thing um just more efficient storage but it's ready to go it's the idea um did that answer it enough i know that i didn't really answer but no, that's fine. I mean, if you don't need to think about it, that that's totally fine. I was yeah, yeah at work. Yeah. I was working with someone who was. I was like trying to get him set up to do a first thing, and he, I uh, like, he didn't. I was like, you're gonna have to learn Roxygen because he's like, oh, I put how to use the arguments in in comments in the function. I was like, yeah, nope, nope, yeah, there. <laughs> so that's that's important to know, and also like all of this is why just copying your installed packages from one version of R to another is usually a bad idea or not usually, but it can be a bad idea because if anything changed in those versions, you have the old compiled versions of things and it might not be compiled to this version of R anymore. Um, so uh, we'll talk about that more later, but that's why like if you upgrade the version of R, uh, the main, like the, um, the second tick, like 4.3.2, if you are, upgrade that to 4.4 um you should reinstall all the all your packages there are systems to help you do that but anyway we'll talk about that more probably later uh hey, the reason is because of this sure yeah it's like i see like cram it's just a story in the last version of binary files at least for windows uh do you have a way to to start prior version of a package Oh, so um, there are, uh, there's something in, well, in pack, I think, if not anything else. I haven't done this in a little while. Can always find it when I go digging. But there are, um, well, okay. So the, the old way to do it was used a uh, system that no longer exists that um, I think it was Microsoft used to run it and they stopped doing it where it, would, it was just like all of the versions of CRAN forever. And uh, Gabor uh, Kasardi at Posit is, I think he's at Posit still. Um, he's making, yeah, he's he's still there. Anyway, he's, he has this ever CRAN project that he's doing um, to have like every version of, of every package ever. Um, but you can, especially if you have, uh, the GitHub version, you can do old releases. I think that's in pack. Um, but it's been a while since I've done or wanted to install old versions. The um, the way to look at it is look at what um, Renv does under the hood, because Renv does install old versions. And so if you look at what happens when you run Renv, um, which I think again, I think that's using pack. It'll, it should tell you, although I guess it's copying binaries, but no, it's still, it, it can just tell you uh, what version it's supposed to be. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would, I would try because, you know, I have a, a Python project and I'm using a development version of OpenSL2. So, yeah. I I have all my my <laughs> work from working, but you know the API changed, and right. it was okay. Great, what I can do with this project? <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean there are um, there are ways to do that. I haven't had to do that in a while, so I can't remember exactly. Um, but 
uh, well, like there's old sources, so you can go like Cran has old source versions, old bundles. Um, so there are ways to install those. I just don't remember exactly what it is, and you'd have to dig around a little bit and pack to yeah. find those. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and to answer the question in chat, uh, or one of the questions in chat, um, bundles are not system specific. They are exactly the source with some rules of what to include and what not to include versus binaries are system specific. And that does include um, the R version, at least the um, major, actually, yeah, 431 versus 432, yes. So if you look at these Windows binaries or Mac binaries, um, they have R devel, R release, R old release, um, so this is the next version of R, this is the current version of R, and this is one tick back from the current version of R. And like Woyais, um, we have that for Mac, and actually it's um, doubled because it's got the ARM and the x86 uh, versions. It doesn't have Devel, actually. Um, Uh, and basically, in the current in the current state, that would be the R release would be R R four point three, and the order would be R four point two, right? Uh, I am pretty sure that it's releases for R four three. Uh, was it four three two, and old release is four three one. But I could have that backwards, and um, I'm not sure. Actually, I should know. Yeah, that, because I can't I, I'm still in R four point two. I don't have any any system in R. And yes, I'm still installing for Chrome. And I know that the build version changes. Right. Um. I don't know. Uh, there is something like I could find this, but I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, yeah. All right. I, and I don't, I don't understand your question. The last question, Rebecca. No, sorry, not a question. You mentioned that pa that our end was using pack under the hood, and I don't think it does by default. Or at least I thought that's what you said. Okay, I. Thought it I could be wrong. You... Updated to oh, okay. but I could okay. be wrong too. Nope. nope. If you think they've updated, I'm sure you're more likely I'm to be right. pretty sure that the latest version of Pack uses I mean the latest version of Ren uses Pack. Um there were actually a couple of things that I was working with that broke when that happened. And so I'm pretty sure I'm remembering right that, that happened. All right. Um all right. I'm gonna try to push through because we only have a few more slides and I want to try to finish. Um, so uh, installed is on your system, ready to use. So if we look back at uh, this graphic from way before, uh, this installed column, you'll notice that there are like lots of different ways to get there. I guess not library, but install packages. Um, you can install packages from source. You can use DevTools install GitHub. Um, you can also use pack pack, which is equivalent to DevTools install GitHub. Um, DevTools install, which you're installing from a local source to uh, the to installed. Um, so yeah, that's it. That's all the ones that will install it. Uh, lots of different ways to do that. But so it's saying, OK, installed means it's in a library. And that is actually, that's two slides from now. Um, because first. Uh, we're going to go over that last step of going into memory, which is just uh, so you can do library, um, which will take, so library use this, loads and installed, use this, and loads it into memory. Um, technically, it also attaches it to the search path, which we'll, we'll talk about later. Um, I didn't include there, but require does basically the same. Oh, actually, we're going to talk about that on the next slide. Um, and then, like, we talked about this a lot <laughs> on the Slack today, DevTools load all or Control shift l um, will take a package that you are working on and basically library it without installing it. Um, and so it loads it into memory directly. Um, 
and again, that's useful as you are working on things. It's also, um, you work with Shiny uh, a lot of times, well, depends what you're doing, but if you do Shiny as a package, um, part of your launch process is package load, load all to load the package that has Shiny and you put that into your Shiny, like the app file that you're gonna launch from. Uh, so package load is the package that DevTools is loading under the hood. All right. And the final slide I have is about uh, libraries, the library command require and um, packages. So in R, a package is a collection of R code. They talk a little bit about how you'll hear people um, like interchangeably use the word package and the word library, but technically in R, a library is a directory of installed packages. Um, in many languages, library means package, like that is the word and so naturally there is confusion um but that does lead to they talk about setting up a user library if you don't already have it um so that the core packages are in one library and any packages you install are in another um almost like that that rarely matters but I actually, there was a whole conversation on um, Mastodon just in the last couple of days that someone was trying to um, like run uh, some code as if they didn't have a package installed. And the only way you can do that is to have a user library so that you can tell R and like briefly, momentarily tell R not to use that user library. Uh, and then R will think that you don't have that package but you can't tell it not to use the system library because that's the system that like is R. Uh, so it is worth going through this work to set up a user library. Um, I didn't go into dot lib paths, just that, I mean, yes, it exists and it can tell you what um, libraries you are using. Uh, that's about as much as there is to say about it. Um, and there's also uh, the with R package has um, functions that with R is like a package for simulating a state. So it's really useful for testing that you can like pretend I don't have this package or pretend that this option is set just for now. And then it'll set that and it always goes back to the state that it was in before it started. So it's really useful for testing because it like returns everything to where it was. Uh, so with R, we'll do kind of a editing of libpaths temporarily. Um, you can library telling it a specific location. And so that's part of how you can make things. Uh, you can have like multiple versions of a package installed effectively. Um, yeah, And just something they point out is you should never, ever, ever use library inside of a package because it does like weird and unexpected things. Uh, for one thing, it will just error and crash everything uh, if it doesn't, if the package doesn't exist versus require, which throws a warning that you can capture and deal with, but it also just like tells you, does that package exist? We'll see that in, um, what was it? Uh, chapter 11, 10 and 11 um, for like how to deal with dependencies that'll go into that um so yeah that's what the require is there and that is the chapter i know i kind of flew through the end there but um we have any questions let's see i can't see what this is uh, yes so yeah you can load this is in um Oh, install. Okay, yes. So for installing a specific package from a uh, URL, you can do um, you can do a GitHub branch. You can do a certain GitHub version um, and the working directory. I still so there's a there's a function somewhere that you can just tell it a version. I think that still works, and it'll like. If it's available on CRAN, you'll just install that version. But I'll try to answer that on Slack. Um, <laughs> and I think 
Uh, so we're going to be wrapping up, but uh, is it Kaya or Kaija? It's Kaya. Kaya? Okay. Uh, Kaya says that she has a question that's meta and off topic. So if other, everyone else wants to leave, that is fine. Um, I guess yeah, if anybody else has have... content questions, please go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Let me load this back up. Um, my thing was just that you mentioned Mastodon, and I wanted to ask if people have sort of settled on a replacement for data science Twitter. I've been basically avoiding the whole situation, and I don't really miss Twitter, but <laughs> I do miss the, the chatter around data science, and I feel like I was better able to keep up with new packages and new stuff going on in R back when um, that was a community, but I know there's Mastodon, I know there's different servers, I know there's Blue Sky, like, is has, is there any sort of consensus yet or should I wait longer? Mastodon seems to have won, I think. Um, there, like, it is still fractured for sure. Um, I haven't noticed anything on Blue Sky that isn't also on Mastodon. And then some stuff is on LinkedIn now that would have previously been on Twitter. Um, but I feel like the core, like the people who talked a lot about R, R on Twitter, mostly do that on Mastodon now. Um, cool. There is a um, rstats dot something server our stats that social our stat i don't remember there is a server that is supposed to be our specific a lot of people are on uh fostodon the um, open source uh server but theoretically it shouldn't matter what server you're on although it does and that's part of the problem with Mastodon. um it's also an advantage but i don't know it makes it very fragmented um you can follow the hashtag our stats on Mastodon, which is nice so I technically follow people, but I mostly just read the RStats hashtag on Mastodon. So um, and there's also a list on Blue Sky that um, uh, Mike, I can't remember his name, but he compiles a um, effectively the RStats hashtag into a list. Um, and it's just to, it's, Fostodon with two S's, fostodon.org. You technically need an invitation, so I will post my invite in our Slack channel. Um, I guess, I don't know, it, has, it, it hasn't been crappy on Fostodon, so maybe it's good that it requires an invitation, but it's server by server and it's all kinds of weirdness. Um, and yeah, there's mastodon.online and there's mastodon.social and whatever the RStats one is, um, they all they all seem to work. Uh, I know like Hadley is posting there sometimes. He mostly has a sub stack now where he's doing stuff. Um, and there are some custom feeds on Blue Sky for some R stuff, but the stuff, the R stuff that I see on Blue Sky is mostly reposted. Like, where I've settled is basically Blue Sky is my everything else social network and Mastodon is my R social network. Um, and yeah, so there are specific servers, but you can still, like, you can see other servers that they federate with. It's just you, you can, like, um, the advantage of the small servers, like the RStats one, is you could actually just, like, follow the, the Firehose feed and it is the RStats hashtag effectively. So um, versus the, like, you know, the feed of just random nonsense on Mastodon is very random. There's no algorithm behind it. And, you know, the algorithm has a lot of hate, but as a purpose, a feed of just random everything is unfollowable. Um, so that's all a thing. Uh, but yeah, all that is to say, I think Mastodon has one for R. Um, no, no, nothing is as good as Twitter was a year and a half ago for R, but oh well. <laughs> Thanks, that helps. <laughs> All right, anything else?
All right. I will see everybody on.